But when it comes to education, there roughly been, you know, almost in office four years now, and looking at where we were, where we are today, and I think where we're going. Uh, you know, many of you, of course, have heard about Georgia being the number one place to do business, they, you know, and I think, you know, that has been a great, great boom for us across the state. But when you look at education, and you look at probably say, what is the sector that has improved the most, has seen the most innovation, has seen the most growth behind the economy? It truly has been education. That's something that, that I take not as credit for myself, but the hard work you know, that's being done at the local level. Uh, and it's been my privilege to support what goes on you know, within your, your counties and schools. You know, we look at our graduation rate, an all-time high now for us as a state. Uh, within a few years, I firmly believe and know that we can make a 90% graduation rate across the state. That, that is very doable for us. Uh, we're right there at the national average, and again, like I said, we, within just a short period of time since taking office, you know, we've advanced 10, 10%. And so we've seen some good growth across there. Actually had some good numbers even this year. But you look at ACT and SAT scores, and this is where we're comparing our kids with those across the nation. And our kids are doing phenomenal work. It is, I mean, we're looking at reading, we're looking at writing, and you know, science with the SAT. We're actually outperforming the nation. So you see that, that our kids are starting to really improve. And in fact, I know some of my opponents, they keep on saying, well, Georgia's ranked 38th in, in something and such and such. Well, they always kind of miss the point, and, and perhaps they need to go back to school to read the report and know what it stands for. Because what you find out is that that some of the things they talk about, we cannot control in education. I cannot go out there and control somebody, what does a, what does a home life look like? I can't control you know, the number of kids that are in poverty right now. But what we can control is academics. Georgia's ranked 11th when it comes to academic performance. So that shows you that's why that number is going down is because of our strength in academics and providing our kids opportunities in life. Dual enrollment right now for our kids. It has grown threefold since being in office, and I think that will continue to grow. Because now many of our kids, in the fact, I was over at Butler High School before I came here, and they were talking about we have kids now that are graduating with a two-year degree, and then a week later stepping up on stage and graduating with a high school degree. And that's paid for. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that right now and how that you know, can benefit our kids across the state. But as we look at that, I, what I firmly believe is is really a mindset has changed in Georgia uh, because as I came into office, all I heard was the test, the test, the test, the test. And at the end of the day, we we're not about tests. We we're about children. And because of that, you know, my goal and my vision of what we should be about in education is preparing our kids for life and not a test. A test is something we do, but it's not what, what we do in education. I believe, firmly believe for us as teachers and educators, administrators, you know, the most important thing we do is build relationships with our children. If we have those positive relationships, we can have an impact on our children. And by cutting back the, the number of tests that we have, were mandated in our state, in fact, we saw the largest reduction of mandated you know, testing in our state's history, we have now given our teachers time to get to know their kids. The focus on what's important, because if we put that focus right, then that means the test will take care of itself. And we are seeing that you know, take place. You know, I like to you know, share with people, so think about who was your favorite teacher. Who was the teacher or teachers that made an impact in your life? For the most part, I can probably safely say I never knew that person, never met that person. But what I can guarantee is that person had a relationship with you. They knew you in a personal way, they knew about you, and they had an impact because you could have a conversation with that individual. And so that is, again, part of that life skills that we're looking at. Technology is great, I tell our young people. But it is just a tool, but you can never replace having the ability to have face-to-face -face interaction with people. That's where it will help you in the long term in getting getting you know along. Now I could not think about doing this job if I was on my phone all the time and texting people. Okay. The way I get to improve education is getting to know people, listening and interacting with them, you know, coming to events like that. And that's one of the things we look at, trying to teach our kids you know, these wonderful skills. But as we look and we move forward, seeing some things that, we're, I, I, the, that we are going to continue to build on in the next four years. Reading is the most important, and again, my opinion, reading is the most important skill that we can transfer to our kids. Don't care what class you go to, where you go in life, if you cannot read, it will put a big damper on your ability to have success. And that's, again, for education, because, I, you know, as I shared, whatever class you go into, you've got to have the ability to read. And that's something we've been doing, putting an emphasis on literacy. We, we actually 
as we looked at this, we, Georgia actually received the largest grant of any state, $61 million, that we pushed in the literacy and reading. And that's because of the strength of our program, the strength of our grant, and the commitment that they have seen. In fact, we're only one of 11, or let's see, we're out of one of 11 states that actually received this grant twice. And so that lets you know that we are committed to make sure our kids can read. A lot of people have looked and said, what about cursive writing? I do believe cursive writing is important. We're trying to get that back you know, to where it needs to be because one of the things we looked at, we talked about the test. Well, guess what we did not test? We did not test cursive writing. Well, that meant that for the large part, we did not teach that. But I do believe that it's extremely important that you learn how to write and cursive write within our state because it gives you a set of skills that allows you to be very competitive. And it's also nice that you can also be able to read the Declaration of Independence yes. and the Constitution. Okay? Yes. So just a you know, sidebar with that, but you get some benefits. Because I, was, I met a young man the other day up in Commerce and uh, his mother brought over to me and, and said, you know, and told me, said, my son cannot read the, the Constitution because he did not learn how to do cursive writing. So those are things you look at and that I know that we have to get back on track. Remember, I, I, I got to go back to our purpose. We're here to prepare our kids for life, okay? And that's, again, we have to make sure that we are continuing to build on that. So that is, we will continue to grow that and re, really even reinforce that uh, in the days to come. But as we look at improving our skills, math, of course, continues to be something we you know, continue to focus on as well. Uh, Georgia has had kind of a rough road with math, to be honest. But I think we've added some stability to it and making some changes. We'll get there. Uh, we're looking at re revitalizing our, our math and English language arts standards in the next uh, you know, go around. Uh, they are still the common core standards. And again, I made no bones about it. I did not like those standards. I thought they were inappropriate, developmentally inappropriate, but we can do better. And so my commitment, I'm very, very glad. This is why it's important to have Governor Kemp in the board because he has told me that we are going to replace those standards and make sure that they are the best that we can have and that it will be Georgia or only Georgia grown. And so I'm excited about that as we, as we move forward. But looking at where we're going, providing our kids opportunity. I think it's so important. One of the things we did within our nation, within our state, is that we mistakenly said that every child needed to go to a four-year university. One of the worst things we ever did is that we undercut and shortchanged technical college education. We undercut military education. We undercut internships and also you know, the ability to go straight into the workforce. But I'm glad to say we're making that shift now, that we're providing our kids wonderful opportunities in our career tech program. Today, there are many states that are coming to us as a state to look at what we are doing within our career tech program. We are probably ranked in, in conversations out here that we're probably one or two when it comes to career tech ed education throughout the nation. And that's something to be very proud of. We're giving our kids opportunities now. You know, if they want to become a plumber, a mason, you know, a carpenter, these are great, great opportunities. There are counties that I go to that do not have these individuals. And I share with people, I said, this past Christmas, my wife and I had to have our air conditioner replaced. I did not call. My college professor gave me okay? But I paid for somebody's Christmas, okay? Whoever put that in, I paid for their Christmas. And probably, a, actually, a couple of Christmases to come, to be honest. But there are great opportunities for our young people in doing this. As we look at true internships, and I appreciate the General Assembly allowing us to make some shift with, uh, with the uh, labor law so that our kids can actually be in business and learning a skill. One of the companies I like to highlight is down in Columbus, a little group called Pratt. Pratt makes jet engines. Now it may be reassuring or maybe somewhat alarming to you that we have high school students making jet engines in the state of Georgia, but we have not lost anyone as of yet. So all the planes are safe. But what Pratt is doing in other industries is they invite our kids in to be an intern and they're giving them a good wage. Again, these young people are making, I think, between 10 to $15 an hour. But in conjunction with that, Pratt is saying, listen, if you stay with us, we will send you to college. And then when you finish college, you will come back and work with us full time and to get a really good paying job. And that was a commitment that we're having a relationship and a dialogue with business and industry that we have never had in our state's history. Because that is something we have to have at the, at the, at the local level is to have a partnership and listen to what business and industry needs. Right now, we are expanding our opportunities for our kids throughout the state and we at the state are listening. If there's something that perhaps is here in Columbia County and Bridgman County that you need, that is a business and industry that is specific to you, we are creating courses 
that support your industry here. A couple of examples. Up in the Elbert County, they have a mining industry. Well, we have a mining pathway. And so those kids are working with inter internships with them. Down in Houston County, they said we need industrial maintenance at Rita Lake. Well, now we have an industrial maintenance pathway. Up here in the Gust area, of course, you now have you know the soccer command that is roll rolling in. Well, we have cyber security you know, classes that we are now offering. And so that is a commitment that we are seeing great things across the state and working in a conjunction. In fact, we just, just recently, we uh, unveiled our, our new economic development school districts. So school districts can now receive a designation that they are economic development certified. And so we have we just awarded our first five. And that's something that as you begin to attract business, say look what our, our schools are doing you know they're being missionaries and talking with business and industry we're working side by side to attract that so that's something we're trying to listen to say how can we support the economic growth in your children and your communities at the state level but as we move from CTA and, and look at some opportunities STEM education that science technology engineering and math right now we have a thousand schools that's almost half the schools in the state of Georgia waiting to become STEM certified. But we've added on top of that, because I'm a firm believer in fine arts. I think band, music, dance, drama, you know, the visual arts are so important. Within Georgia right now, our fine arts programs, or at least our industry, is multi-billion dollars. And that's something that you know, we need to support. So now we actually have an individual that is, is our fine arts person at the Department of Education. And that was after a 23-year absence at the department. We did not have anyone that was focused on that. And that was something I wanted to change. And so we have a young lady that, that's up there that is just knocking it out of the park when it comes to fine arts education. But going back to STEM education, one of the things we looked at when we added since coming on board is that instead of just being STEM-oriented, we are STEAM-oriented too. We put the fine arts component into that. And so that expands our opportunities for our kids. It expands, uh, you know, things, uh, the, the opportunities within our children. Because what you have with, with STEM and STEAM education is that you have not just a teacher doing something, but you have a cluster of teachers doing something. You have a school that is focused on STEM and STEAM. And one of the components of that as well is that they involve the community. They involve business and industry. And so what a great partnership is that you have, you know, the relevance of real life coming into our classes, into our schools, so that our kids can make that you know, connection there. And so I'm excited about those opportunities because this is really the, the destination for these young people. It is the jobs of the future. Now as we proceed to do that, we talk about you know, being ready for life. But one of the things I was very appreciative and that was kind of on my, my to-do list was I wanted to make sure that every child within our high school setting, I think we can even expand that down to our research as well, but especially the high school setting, I wanted to make sure that we had a personal finance class that could be made available to our young people. Our young people need to know how to manage money. When we talk about credit cards, debt, school, these are this, of this nature. And so this past year, or this year, in fact, this, this is the beginning of school year, we had that opportunity, we created the class, you know, for that. Now, I hope somewhere down the road that it becomes an either or class. I don't think everyone needs to necessarily have a, take a traditional econ class. And econ is great, but you can only have so many economists in the state. But I think everyone can benefit from personal finance. Mm -hmm. Because I tie this again, I'll go back to, to, to why personal finance is so important. And we talk about dual enrollment as well. For our young people in the state of Georgia, for anybody that's in higher ed, that when they're in, in college, about the time they graduate, they have accumulated on average in the state of Georgia $28,000 of debt. Well, that's that they're going to you know, start their life off with. But about the time they graduate from higher ed, they like to start putting one of these little gold bands on their finger, or maybe something that has a little diamond attached to it. So when that person said I uh, said I, I do, they also gave them an IOU for $28,000, okay? So you collectively say that that couple has started, you know, their life $56,000 on debt. And that's on average. That's, you know, it could go a little bit higher, you know, a little bit lower, depending where you want to go to college. But I think within the state of Georgia, we have good opportunities. With dual enrollment, what that can do is that we can help and support that because that's an education that's paid for. Two years of, of college credit. But with the Hope Scholarship, Zell Miller Scholarship, that means that a child can have their four-year degree paid for. And I, I can tell you, as an individual that had to pay back all my stuff, 
this is something that our state does well, and taking advantage of that can really open up some opportunities. Because that's so critical, because we start to make some ties with that, because the family is the most important unit, bar none, that has an impact on us in education. Because what happens at home does not stay at home. It, it comes directly to us. But if we can get young people who can manage money, manage finances, what you begin to start looking at sometimes as a couple is that within Georgia, one of the things that we face that we cannot you know, have control over is that we have between a 50 to 60% divorce rate. Well, guess what? One of the number one things, if not the number one thing, that affects the divorce. Okay. So if we're teaching our kids how to manage and survive and thrive, well, they just might save the family. And I guarantee you, for us, if we are saving families in the state of Georgia, education better watch out because we are just going to knock it out the roof. That's just the, the, the connections we make. But that's, and I'll kind of finish one thing and transition into something else. Is that for us, I mean, I, I love American history. I love teaching our, our Constitution, our Declaration. I was a, a history teacher at high school. Well, what we've been able to do is expand U.S. history within the K-5 education. Instead of taking two, we have actually three years of U.S. history. One of the things that I try to do you know, each year is that we hand out constitutions. Well, and that's, and that's not state money. That's through private you know, uh, donations. Well, we've been doing that, and we try to make sure we give all of our fourth graders a constitution within, within the, you know, our state. That's the first year they see the constitution in an academic setting. But that pocket constitution has the constitution, it has the Declaration of Independence, it has the Pledge to the Flag, and it also has the Star Spangled Banner. But with the Star Spangled Banner, it's not just what we sing as our national anthem, but it has all the verses that are penned by Francis Scott Key. So if you want to kind of get a little more learning and really see the, the depth of what Francis Scott Key was talking about, you need to kind of take that, that second look, because that's pretty powerful, again, what he's looking at. So we're trying to em emphasize that. I hope, again, with the second term is that we can see U.S. history actually talk for two years up in high school as well. I think that we can slow it down and, and again, will allow our kids to learn it in depth and they can look, dive deeper into, uh, you know, what, what our country and greatness really is, uh, you know, throughout this, you know, throughout our state's history. But uh, as I finish there, I want to kind of shift a little bit and talk about the election. Uh, you know, election is very, very important. For me in this race, you know, why is it important to have Ryan Kemp as governor? Because the governor appoints the state school board. Okay? That's, that's a big deal. Those are individuals that I have to deal with and work with in policy. And, I, and it makes it you know, very nice that I can have a governor that I can go to, we can have conversations and support. That's you know, first and foremost as we look at that. Uh, I've actually had some conversations with Secretary Kemp, and I'm, said, I'm excited. I'm excited for what the future holds in Georgia because of that. And so that's what we have to look at. For myself and, and probably other candidates are here with school board, you know, we're, we're all what we call the down ballot, okay? I'm your constitutional officer and I'm about as down ballot as you can get. I think, I think PSC gets a little less love than I do. <laughs> but during the primary, what you had to take place in the state of Georgia, you had 100,000 Republicans that did not vote for this race. In other words, they voted for governor, but that's where they stopped. Now, I can tell you, 100,000 votes makes a big difference. Okay. We have to take every seat serious. And so for many of you, I know you have, you have voted, but as you meet and engage with people, it's like you need to go all the way down. I like to tell people, kind of use my name a little tongue in cheek, I said, listen, when you go vote, you want to make sure you go all the way to the woods. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to stop in the woods, you want to go through the woods, okay? <laughs> there are people that are just as important that fall underneath me. There are amendments too that we're voting for. Those have a big impact. So we need to make sure that we go up and down or some a little boss and I think it should be Republican all the way but it's important that we make sure that, that we don't stop somewhere on the path. It's important that we go because every vote counts. Last time when I ran in 2014 I got into a runoff. So within that runoff, I won that runoff statewide by 700 votes. Okay, that, that, that's about as close as you get. 700 votes. A county could have flipped that easy. A district could have flipped that. And so that's important. And I said that every vote counts. When people say my vote won't count, 
You know, I said, I'm not. I said, it does make a difference. And so I encourage you as you go out, please, you know, you know, rally the base. I mean, I know I'm talking to the choir here. But what I have found out is that people look for you for leadership. They look for you. In fact, you may say you vote once, but in reality, you probably vote multiple times. Because if it's like my wife who gets calls, who should I vote for? Well, she gives that list. And I encourage you that if you don't have yard signs in your yard, trust me, people go by and they look, oh, such and such is voting for that person. You can express your voice in many different ways. I have some signs here, but I encourage you to get these other candidates away. Just, just plant a garden of signs, okay? <laughs> I mean, they, they bloom for a short time. After November 6th, you can, you can take that garden down, unless you want to brag, okay, <laughs> and celebrate. But that's important. Uh, I do have some, some cards as well over here on the table. I tried to make them small so you can put them in your pocket and not tote, you know, some big sheet around. Uh, and so I appreciate that. If you just want to give somebody something, say, hey, just consider. Go to woodsforsuper.com, you know, and check us out. If you're engaged in Facebook or social media, Twitter, join us on that as well and try to get that information out. I mean, that's one of the ways we look at it. Mean, this is down ballot. We do the best we can. We're down to the short road for 13 days, I think. Next week is kind of the bus tour, so I know collectively we'll be trying to travel together and, and hit the state. But uh, again, I want to thank you for everything you're doing for you who are candidates and are in the elected office. You know, thank you for what you do, your office, and your service. It takes a lot to step out. I'll be honest. I don't care whether it's people that say, "Well, how do you do it statewide?" And I'm thinking, well, "How do you do it local?" I mean, I mean we heard from me walk well, nine thousand doors. Yes. I might need another pair of shoes, okay? <laughs> so, so those are things you look at. The dynamics are always a little bit different, but you at the grassroots, you make the difference because that's what we need to do. So I think I appreciate your time, appreciate being allowed to come today, and uh, I think with a few questions or whatever we find, you, you cut me off. Okay, yes ma'am. Um, this is an issue that is being addressed now with uh, undocumented and documented migrant workers. And I presume that in the homeland of Georgia, there, there probably are uh, <coughs> workers. So I want to know, how does the um, county schools integrate <coughs> these kids into the school system? And what kind of accountability are there? And all the way up from kindergarten, end up to high school, and one of the key issues that Stacey Abrams brought up is, of course, being able to open up a big scholarship for these workers. Well, in order for you to qualify to get a hoop scholarship, you have to have good grades. So it begins from the very small child. How is that being accomplished out there in the counties and the cities? Well, within the within Georgia, and I think probably the probably U.S. as well, but we cannot deny anybody that's a, a school-aged child, we serve them. If we don't ask them who, what, where, citizen, non-citizen, whatever, that's that's something we have to do legally at all. Um, depending where they're at, I mean, the earlier we can have an impact, I mean, the earlier the better. I mean, that's that's the truth. So if we, if we have students at an earlier age, then we're going to have a, a much more positive impact, I think. Because we're talking about language there. Right. Um, and I'm and assuming so, that you're teaching classes in English yes. and not opening up just Spanish classes for them. It depends on the local level. Now, there are some bilingual areas and support, and it will vary from, from state, I mean, from, from district to district. Uh, one of the things we look at, and I think that's why we need to re review our, our funding formula. Our funding formula, again, I'm glad the state, you know, and the legislature fully funded it this year. But it's still a 1985 funding formula. I taught in the 80s. Georgia looks a whole lot different, you know, in the 80s than it does 20, 2018. Population's demographics has changed. If we can use that money, you know, based on need and allow our local districts to say, if that is a, an issue, if it's, you know, an English language learner, I mean, we do have supports for, for that. But so much of that is going to have to be handled at the local level because, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So it's trying to free up those, those options. But some of the things we are doing as well, right now we have a pilot, which we call our Title I funds. Title I funds come, come from, uh, the, from the national government. Uh, typically they go to a high poverty area, 
But with that, we're trying to give our, our schools and districts flexibility in how they use that. In the past, it was very, very, very bureaucratic and restrictive. But now they said, oh, listen, we're having a, an issue with our English language learner uh, population, then they can move money in there. Within our schools as well, we have something called our Continuous Needs Assessment Program. And so you may have a great high-flying school, but they may have an English language learner population that's not doing well. Well, what they are now looking at is that now we're looking at a comprehensive approach. It's not just that you're doing well, but you may, have, may, may need to put some focus on an underserved group to make sure there's some balance. So we are trying to you know, spread that out to do, because I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're doing what's best for our kids and, and it's who we have to serve. And so we are accountable. Yeah, well, they are, but we, like to, but we, are, like to, we are accountable for that. The accountability of the system, I mean, it, they're all part of the mix. And if they don't perform, then it's gonna show up somewhere in the accountability system. So uh, with that, I mean, with, as far as looking at the Hope Scholarship and, and things of that nature, I mean, it is trying to make sure that our, all our kids, I want them to succeed. Um, now, who gets the hope and things of that nature? I know that always continues to come up. And those are issues, I think, that really, but it's outside of my preview with the General Assembly. So as far as us, we do try to make sure that every student that's, is, that's entered into our schools that we're meeting those needs the best we can. I think for us, it's trying to give local schools flexibility just because the populations differ. And I think trying to make sure we don't have a one size fits all. So that's kind of where we are. Yes, ma'am. Um, this was, I think, at our last meeting on the Parent Advisory Council. You had talked about the bilingual schools that you guys are interested in. Can you explain that to this group as well? Because okay. we've done it so excited about okay. hearing about that. Well, I, one of the things we have in, across the state, which is really growing, I, I mean, I give hats off to Patrick Wallace, who is over uh, our, our foreign language area. But we have something called dual immersion. Dual immersion is actually when students are learning our native language, the English, and typically that's going to be in math, and it's going to be in, in English and reading. Okay, that's where we're living. But in other subject matters, we actually can allow them to learn in a different language. And so I've been over to a, a few schools where it may be that they're learning maybe science, to be PE, health, in French. Well, they're learning it at kindergarten. And they're taking it for five years in a row. And, I, and I'll be honest, the kindergarten students I ran into, they spoke better <coughs> than I did in high school. And that was after just kindergarten. That was a full year. But so we are trying to expand those opportunities to make sure that our kids perhaps have that bilingual opportunity. Because a lot of people, and I think you probably see it here, military, well, guess what? You have a lot of interest in foreign language. And the military is looking as if, you know, if you're looking to join that, if you are bilingual, you get the uptick. It always probably even an uptick in pay as well. It even it even rain. Within Atlanta and of course outside the area, as we continue to grow, we have a lot of industry that is now coming in internationally. Well, those individuals are thinking to, we really want to hire these young people. And so we're talking with business and industry. In fact, this year we just opened up our first Japanese dual immersion class or school. And so our kids are now learning Japanese. The Japanese Chamber of Commerce is looking at that group saying, this could be our future workforce. And so that's the excitement about the dual immersion area. I, I hope that as we continue to grow, what I would like to see is that for any teacher that's considering to go into education, consider having a second major in foreign language. You think of what we could accomplish and what we could do, because that's, that's really the hardship of us is we don't have enough teachers. But it expands that ability for our kids to now look at the world, to look at business and industry, and that really makes Georgia very attractive because when, inter when the international community comes in, like, oh, you have a school that teaches Japanese, or Korean, or German, or French, or Spanish, or Portuguese. Well, that's, that's a bonus for you at the local level. If you can say, hey, look at us in Augusta, if you want to come here and bring your industry, we can support you internationally. So that's something where we're at and really an exciting time for us. And, 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 that, and that methodology is just expanding. And, you know, it's yes, ma'am. I have another question. And I feel like everything that you have been doing is a great job. One thing I, I 
haven't heard and I don't hear enough sure. is mental health. Okay. I deal with a lot of children with mental health and their parents. And that's one of the biggest problems. That's that's like the nationwide problem. What are we going to do in Georgia for mental health? Okay. It's well, I would, actually, I'm glad our colleagues didn't put that into the presentation, but it's always part of what we do. We are doing a lot of in Georgia as well. Uh, this past go around, we, uh, with the work of the legislature, there is actually something we call APEX. APEX is a program that addresses mental health, mental health needs and concerns. And so it is trying to expand that statewide. So we're looking at capacity with that. Telemedicine, and again, of course, with that, you know, we're able to expand that as well. Giving our ability to, to increase our, our, our counselors. Our counselors are, you know, are definitely with that. And they're, they're probably a very over, overworked group. Um, you know, within the state, we have typically one counselor per 500 kids in the state. So you just have a burden of there's a lot of kids, and there's a lot of need out there uh, within the state. And so, you know, we were trying to find things in conjunction with that. We were able to find $40 million that was just sitting on the shelf. And that was something that was, that was just money that was sitting up there that we were able to put, and we're going to be able to, to I think, just about double uh, our, our school nurses in that area. So that's something we looked at, and perhaps even uh, we're expanding the opportunity to, can we expand that to mental health services? Uh, because if money's out there, then we want to make sure we're a part of it. And, and people ask, well, why didn't we do that before? <clears throat> Nobody asked. So I just told my staff, let's go ask and see what's out there and see what we can do. Uh, it is trying to work that we are collaboratively working with other state agencies because there are state agencies that there's no need to duplicate the wheel. I mean, if we can work with them and invite them into our schools and make them a part and integrate them in there, then I believe working with you know, family and human resources, uh, you know, foster you know, kid program. You know, so there are other things we're looking at doing to expand it. And for us as, as a state, going back to Title I funds, Title I funds can now be used to support wraparound services and especially in the area of mental health. Uh, we have committed in giving, I think, just uh, $1 million in that area, uh, looking at school safety as well. So again, you know, that's something that's really on the, on the, in the minds of anyone. Uh, we do work with school safety, we work with GEMA. GEMA really kind of corrals everyone locally, you know, with all our emergency management people working with their schools to, to have that plan in place. Uh, we look at facilities, when anyone's looking to build a new facility, we, have, we, we make sure that we look at that now and say, what is your safety plan? What does that structure look like? So that no one can just walk in, and you have to have some thoughts. Of course, with uh, the work with the General Assembly, uh, we have multiple billions, millions of dollars that were given to schools, and we hope to expand that as well. So yes, we are looking at very comprehensive. Things are, you know, and finally, we're actually hearing the legislature talk. And that, and it's just been just trying to get that dialogue. It's been a part of our plan since day one. When you look at our strategic plan, we know that there are things that, that, that have an impact on a child's life that are not just academics. But you got to be ready to learn before you start to learn. And so we're looking at that. I mean, school nutrition is something we're looking at. Trying because many of our kids now work at a school with high poverty. And I remember, I mean, kids, they used to go around picking up, you know, bags of Pop-Tarts mm -hmm. or muffins that, I mean, and they put them in the book bag. Because what I knew was that that it probably was breakfast you know, or dinner or anything was there. So we're working with, with, with some individuals now that, that for the food that perhaps is unused and food that, I mean, <coughs> will be thrown away, so how do we put that and save that and store that and provide it for families and for kids that are going out. So we're doing some things that, you know, up and down the state that is kind of really some unique things. So, um, you know, trying to get them there, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see what happens, but I'm you know, glad to say that we're, we're actually looking and listening to people on that for the first time. But that, like I said, it's just, I mean, it, I, mean I tell people education is like an aircraft <clears throat> try to turn it, but we turn it with oars. We don't use an engine, okay? We do it, it, it sometimes goes very slowly, but once we make that turn, we're seeing the good things that are out there. So that's kind of where we're at. Yes? Well, I think the second language is great, you know, having multiple languages is great, but I think one thing that we don't do is we not have when we have a high population of uh, Hispanic, you know, who are here in the Italy, that kind of situation. I know some schools are really affected. We don't <coughs> emphasize enough that how we need to get those kids oh, wow. to be proficient in English. Because if they don't speak the language, then they cannot be successful. 
Yes. And uh, I know from my experience learning English as second language after I came here, yes. you know, when somebody who was kind to me and they tried to accommodate my language mm -hmm. and English, mm -hmm. I did not learn as fast mm -hmm. as until they put me in a situation where I was not allowed to be speak Korean while I was in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I think people look at it as it's so not compassionate to require them to speak English. But I think we needed to do that for their benefit mm -hmm. and our benefit. Well, and that's why I said with that, we do not compromise teaching English. Yeah, that, we do that for every every student. And when we talk about for those that are coming in who speak a different language other than English, I mean, it benefits us and benefits them to learn English. I mean, because if you're going to live in the United States, is the language that we speak. So if you don't learn English, I go back and say it cuts down opportunities for them. And so I said, we do not compromise on that. But on the flip side, I mean, the importance of, of for those that speak English, if you learn another language, well, that opens up opportunities for you. So it's lo looking at expanding opportunities across the board. But yeah, I, I would never compromise on that. I mean, I think it, it I mean, because guess what our, I mean, typically we look at our test, guess what our test is, milestones, it's in English. And those are things that we have to look at. And that is the goal to, to make sure that we give our kids opportunity. But yeah, we don't, we definitely don't compromise. We have time for one more question. Okay. I think Steve yes. had a question. Somebody over here had a question. Go ahead. No, no. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask about the Korean language and how it affects Say civics, we have civics, and it may be even lately of civics or government. So it's it's embedded within that course. But I go back to the point with with U.S. history, being able to expand that, and, because I mean part of civics is embedded within our U.S. history. So we have that in, in K-5, and we have three years instead. But as I go up, we look at, at Georgia history. It will be taught, of course, since we are one of the original 13 colonies. You have you have that. Again, my goal is to have two years of U.S. history, and I think that will reinforce the civics aspect of it. Now, one of the things we've looked at now is that you can actually, for our students, we've introduced this year, you can graduate with a civic seal. Okay. And so part of that means that you would take a, a, uh, uh, a citizenship test. I mean, just to know that you qualify as a basic, can you pass a basic citizenship test? So we have that. It is a model in which you actually are engaged with a civic product, so you get civically engaged, but it also reinforces the information that you're talking about. Yes, we can always do better. Uh, and, and I would always say to you, I, I know we look at you know, the water world, man on the street, and things of this nature. I know we don't see all the, all the, we don't see all the film, so I can only say I know it, but those people that they do put on there, you make us look as bad as you possibly can. So I don't know the truth behind that. But is that something we're trying to reinforce? Sure, it is trying to reinforce. I think by expanding those options that we have, working with our standards, I mean, we, we look at that, and that's why I think two years of, of slowing it down, um, you know, is so important. So, you know, I can only say this is relatively new changes for us. Uh, when I talk about the SEAL, that is brand new. That's never been done in the state of Georgia. So hopefully the intent is as we continue to grow and our continu kids continue to uh, graduate from this point on, they have that. Uh, and we are trying to do more things that, you know, get them involved to where, I mean, it's, I mean it, it kindergarten and in the early grades, it's nice you can know a fact. George Washington was the first president, great. But you need to be able to say, when we talk about, you know, talk about the Constitutional Convention, what are the steps there? Why would you want to do a Constitutional Convention? You know, what, what, is, what are your rights with it? I mean, when you talk about the amendments, you know, I mean, I think it's very important that you understand and be able to go say, well, let's have, no, I'm learning about the amendments, but why don't I you know, look at the Federalist Papers? Why don't I go back to where they write? I mean, a lot of people talk to me about you know, freedom of religion. I said, well, why don't you kind of go back and read Jefferson's letter, you know, to the church that he was talking about? You might have a different perspective of how the Supreme Court, you know, ruled. Because what Jefferson said and what 
you know, is the way that we used to hold things when you look at the truth there. So it is trying to teach our kids, you know, the value of their uh, civics is extremely important. Uh, I was, again, I was a history teacher, and I love to teach that, and we were engaged. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to see that. We are trying to expand our exposure to that uh, throughout Georgia.